morning everyone it's amber here i am going to be reading the next chapter of what was the battle of gettysburg so i'm kind of wondering how everyone's doing with this whole covid19 stuff you know like are you at home are you still in school at work uh, are you bored do you need something to do you can always watch my videos of reading these books they're kind of interesting i actually think they're interesting myself and i'm an adult and have three kids um so please read on if you like please uh if you like these videos please hit the like button down below and then also subscribe that'd be great i'd appreciate it all right here we go chapter four is what i'm on i didn't even know what chapter i was on sorry guys okay day two of july 2nd 1863 while Union troops tried to catch a few hours of sleep, General George G. Meade arrived at Gettysburg. It was one o'clock in the morning on July 2nd. His army of 80,000 men was not far behind him and would arrive soon. That's like both pictures here. To show everyone. Okay, let's see here. So there's a neat picture, but these are on a different, pa um, different kind of paper, so it's kind of cool. So the top one says... Union General George Meade. Okay. This one down here is the Confederate, Confederate General Richard Ewell. And then this one over here is the Confederate General James P. Longstreet. I thought that was kind of cool. Meade. And there's more. Whoa. Hold on. There's actually really, really cool pictures. I'm excited to show. Okay. First one is the Confederate dead at Gettysburg. So this top one right here. And then Devil's Den. Is that one. And then the next one is the Little Round Top. Which is this one right here at the top. That one. Okay. And then Gettysburg, 1863 at the bottom here. There's a lot of cool pictures. This is a cool book. All right, Union Dead at Gettysburg. It's on this top one right there. And then Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States of America. And then this one over on this side is the Confederate General Georgie Pickett, who led the disastrous charge. Okay. And then the tombstones in the cemetery at Gettysburg Military Park. Oof, da. It's a lot of tombstones. And then Abraham Lincoln given his famous address at Gettysburg. Um, this is pre uh, as President Abraham Lincoln was Commander-in-Chief of the Union Forces. Okay. Joshua Chamberlain, a Union General, awarded the Medal of Honor for his efforts at Gettysburg. Is this one right here? Confederate General Jeb Stuart, Lee's Trusted Scout. And this is General Robert E. Lee, the commanding officer of all Confederate forces. Whoa. Union revolvers and gear. That's cool. This is the Union knapsack with artifacts, including a bayonet. Surgeon's coat and medical kit. Nowadays, I think this doctor's coats and surgeon's coats are white. Medical kits probably look a lot different. Amputation kit dating back to 1863. Oh my word. I'm glad I don't have to have that used on me. We have hospitals and such. Union soldier from the 22nd New York State Militia at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Is this one right there? 
Confederate soldier standing next to the model 1857 gun howitzer, Napoleon, the most common field artillery of the Civil War. Crazy, hit that one right there. Seventh New York State Militia Officer in uniform. Now your uniforms are kind of different. They almost look like dresses. Unless it's, uh, it must be a really long coat or something. Show you again. All right. Portrait of the Union soldiers from the Company 1 24th Infantry Re Regiment, one of 175 regiments of American, African American soldiers who were first recruited in 1863. This is a pretty cool pic. picture. And then two African American Union soldiers in full uniforms. And the bottom one's the African American Union soldier with his family. So cute. So what did it say again for my very first part of my kit? Mead toured the area and discussed a battle plan with other officers. The troops were spread out o over almost four miles. That is a very long battle line, but geography had worked in the Union's favor. One end of their line hooked back like a reverse fish hook. Okay, I'm going to show you this picture before I move on. Culp's Hill and Little Round Top were only two miles apart. General Meade wanted his reinforcements to stay behind the ridge in between these two hills. That way he would be able to easily move men to wherever on the line they were most needed. The long battle line gave Meade another advantage. Robert E. Lee would have to spread his troops across an almost six mile long line to contain the Union forces. More brigades were arriving to strengthen each army. Men slept by campfires that dotted the hills and fields around Gettysburg. Soldiers cleaned their equipment. Many wrote letters to their families. Often they complained about the food, the weather, and boredom. They asked for socks, sewing kits, wool blankets, and more letters from home. I'm just going to send that, show you this picture. Long before dawn on July 2nd, Robert E. Lee, the South, and George Meade of the North were both planning for the day's battle. Meade's strategy was simple. He would place cannons along the entire line from Cemetery Hill to Little Round Top. Infantry would fill in between the canyons. Cannons. The army was in place to bombard any part of the battlefield below. Lee met with James Longstreet and Richard Ewell, two generals under his command, to discuss the plan for the day. The two younger officers disagreed about what to do. The day before, Ewell had hesitated about chasing after Union troops. Now he wanted to attack the Union line between the two hills. He thought doing this would force General Meade to move troops from a third hill, Culp's Hill, in order to help out the northern units under attack. Then Ewell's men could charge up Culp's Hill and take it. They would have a good spot from which to fire at the enemy. Here's a picture. General Longstreet disagreed with General Ewell. He felt the Union position was too strong. He told Lee they should not continue fighting at Gettysburg. They should move their army south and get between the Union Army and Washington, D.C. Meade would have to come after them. They could find a battlefield that would give them the advantage over the north. Lee said, we will stay in Gettysburg and finish them off. After all, the South had beaten northern soldiers two times in Bo at Bull Run and also at Fredericksburg and Chancel Chancellorsville. He believed his men could roll over anything. All along, his idea had been to fight in Pennsylvania and win. Mm, there's General Longstreet. Longstreet had no choice but to accept Lee and Ewell's plan. Now he argued in favor of the Confederate soldiers taking a route that would keep them hidden from the enemy. 
It was a longer route, but worth it in Longstreet's opinion. Lee agreed. Unfortunately, the troops did not get into place until the afternoon. This gave the Union side hours to dig in and prepare for an attack. See, Longstreet was very, very, sounds like he was very smart, but he didn't, Lee didn't want to do what he stated. Now, if he would have done what Longstreet wanted, what would have happened with the United States of America that it is today? I mean, where would we be? Would there be two different countries? The northern country and the southern country? We don't know. It's crazy to think stuff like that. All right. Union General Dan Sickles was in charge of anchoring the left end of the Union line at Little Round Top. Sickles had no military training. He'd been a state senator from New York before the war. All on his own, he decided to move his troops a half mile forward into an area known as Devil's Den. Other troops under Sickles were placed in a peach orchard and still others in a wheat field. So there's General Sickles in the bottom cage there where my fingers are. Sickles did all this without General Meade's permission. Meade would not have given the okay for this. At four o'clock, the Confederates finally started their attack. They were surprised to find Sickles' men so far ahead of the rest of the Union line. In the fierce fighting that followed, Sickles' Union troops suffered heavy losses. After the war, Sickles ins insisted that his plan was much better than Meade's. Sickles would even try to take credit for the Union victory, but most historians think that Sickles did was a mistake. Sickles' men retreated. Those that were still alive, wound up where Meade had originally placed them, wound up, sorry, wound, wound up where Meade had originally placed them. As for Sickles, the war ended for him that afternoon when a cannonball shattered his right leg. He was carried from the battlefield to a first aid station where the leg had to be cut off. Oof. Sickles did not want the army doctor to just throw his leg away, so he had an aide retrieve the leg after the war. The leg. After the war, Sickles put the bones in a box shaped like coffin. He donated it to a museum in Washington, D.C. Oh, my word. He visited his leg every year on July 2nd, the anniversary of the battlefield. Meanwhile, Little Round Top was totally unprotected. Union General Governor Warren discovered that deserted summit <clears throat> had sent a frantic message to Meade, send troops now. General Meade sent companies from Maine, New York, Pennsylvania, and Michigan to secure Little Round Top. They succeeded, and although Little Round Top was attacked again and again, it was never captured. So I don't know what you guys think about this whole bone thing. I mean, it's interesting that he put it in a museum, but it's also kind of strange, I guess. I don't know, because one, he didn't follow rules of his boss, which he should have. And two, it's kind of interesting because it was part of the war. I don't know. It's kind of weird. What do you guys think? And there's another picture here. You have to let me know. Okay, the story of the 140th Charlie Spiesberger. Spiesberger? The New York 140th Infantry was among the companies fighting to control Little Round Top. It was from Rochester, New York, and was led by Colonel Patrick O'Rourke. The O'Rourke's were an immigrant, immigrant Irish family. Many of the men in the New York 140th were immigrants like him. More than 500,000 soldiers who fought in the Civil War had not been born in the United States. 18-year-old Charlie Spiesberger was one of the young immigrant recruits in the 140th. His family was from Aust Austria. He had only been in the army for nine months. The letters that he wrote home were in German. In one, he said that he hoped his parents would use money he had sent for themselves and to fix up the house. He arrived at Gettysburg with the rest of the company in the early morning hours of July 2nd. They had marched for hours. Some of the men walked barefoot because of the blisters on their feet. O'Rourke and his men had to help hold Little Round Top. They reached the crest just as Confederate soldiers were coming up this other side. The rebels were only 30 feet away. Immediately, O'Rourke led a charge down the hill. Seconds later, he was shot in the neck and killed. Charlie and the rest of the 140th continued the charge. The rebels were pushed back. Little Round Top was in Union hands. Besides O'Rourke, 25 soldiers from the 140th died that afternoon. One of them was 18-year-old Charlie Spiesberger. He was my grandfather's uncle. 
Jim O'Connor. That's kind of, that is very cool, actually. I like that. Neat little story. Cool. Confederate General Ewell's troops attempted to capture Culp's Hill. The southern attack was slow and bloody. The hill was steep and had many large boulders that the soldiers had to climb over. It was hard for them to gain any ground. The rebels did, did very little damage, and the return fire from the Union troops were devastating. By late in the day, the southerners had, had a foothold near the bottom of the hill. Ewell planned for an early attack at dawn the next day. He hoped to take the northern our enemy by surprise. We'll see if that actually happens. So I'll end that here today. And then the next time I'll read chapter five. And I hope you guys all have a great day. And feel free to message me. I'd be great to hear what you guys all think about this. Um, I'll see you in the next video. Have a great day.